It is the infrastructure project connecting the world by land and sea. Ten years on, we take a look at the impact of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Chinese President Xi Jinping launched the Belt and Road Initiative during a speech in Kazakhstan on September 7, 2013, proposing new trade routes to create a new Silk Road and wider economic cooperation. A decade later, 152 countries have seen 3,000 BRI projects and nearly a trillion dollars in new investment. By Chinese estimates, it's helped nearly 40 million people out of poverty. Back in Kazakhstan, where it all began, trade between the two countries under BRI reached a record high last year. CGTN's Ju Ju has more in this report. We are now here in Elma Eda, the largest city in Kazakhstan. It is located just around 300 kilometers from the Chinese border. Under the Belt and Road Initiative, trade cooperation between the two nations have surged. According to data from Kazakhstan's National Bureau of Statistics, China was a vital trading partner of Kazakhstan in the first half of this year. Bilateral trade soared by more than 20 percent, reaching over 13.6 billion U.S. dollars. Among Chinese exports to Kazakhstan, electronic products topped the list. Phones and smartphones account for over 900 million U.S. dollars in trade, marking a nearly 30 percent increase from the previous year. They are followed by computers, clothing, tires, and automotive components. Chinese entrepreneurs investing in Kazakhstan have focused primarily on logistics and warehousing, manufacturing, and the construction sector. On the other hand, Kazakhstan's major exports to China include crude oil and petroleum products, with a remarkable year-on-year -year growth that has more than doubled. Exports following are refined copper and copper alloys, as well as natural gas. And during my trip here, I visited many marketplaces and found that Chinese goods, especially everyday essentials and electronic products, are very popular among the locals. This growing demand also reflects the strong potential for trade cooperation expansion between the two countries. Again, that was CGTN's Ju Ju reporting from Kazakhstan. There's a lot to talk about. Let's get right to our panel. Jorge Heine served as Chile's ambassador to China. He's currently a research professor at Boston University School of Global Studies. Anthony Moretti is an associate professor at Robert Morris University. Also with us is Ibrahim Rasool. He served as South Africa's ambassador to the United States. And Einar Tangent is a senior fellow at the Taihua Institute and the founder and chair of Asia Narratives. And Einar, let's start uh, with you uh, and let's talk numbers. Ten years, 152 countries, nearly a trillion dollars in new investment. The numbers speak volumes, don't they? Well, they do, um, and it's also uh, behind a, a lot of trends that we see here now. I mean, uh, w the fact is, while China has been doing this, other countries have been, in essence, sitting on their hands, and that's really beginning to show. Uh, you see an invigorated uh, BRICS Plus now, uh, very clearly uh, responding to this idea that no longer is the G7, 8, uh, or 20. Uh, going to solve their problems. A uh, hundred billion dollars a year in aid never materialized. Meanwhile, China was only able to provide a fourth of what was necessary, but they're already beginning to show results. And I know, let's dig a little bit deeper into these numbers. I mentioned 152 countries, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 52 come from African, uh, the, the African continent, 40 in Asia. Uh, you see a sprinkling from the Middle East and Europe as well, uh, as well as Latin America. Um, but you've heard the complaints from the U.S. and, of course, from Western countries, you know, these whispers that this is a debt trap. I want to play some sound from the uh, Chinese ambassador to Indonesia talking about this criticism. The very purpose of BRI is to enhance the connectivity in order to promote development, common development. So if that was just driven by China's own selfish pursuits or geopolitical ambitions, attempts, as described by some Western governments, according to their own experience, you can't explain why in the past 10 years more and more countries get on board. Heiner, uh, you've heard the debt trap argument over and over again. I want to get your thoughts on that. 
Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's ironic. Uh, there's been no proposal uh, from those who say that there's a debt trap going on to actually address the, uh, you know, the, the needs of these countries to have development. I mean, quite frankly, if you were cynical, you would say that these developed countries were deliberately trying to keep these uh, other countries down by refusing to allow them to uh, develop. I mean, without climbing the value chain. Uh, trying to, to take their resources and add value to them. These countries are never going to go anywhere. And as we've seen uh, most recently in, in Africa, uh, these countries have just had enough. They say, you know, we have gold, we have diamonds, we have minerals, and yet we have no food. Uh, I think it's particular to the global south. I think uh, Jorge Heine, who was on this show, the ambassador, uh, has really summed it up. Uh, this is about uh, a new kind of movement uh, and an enhanced ability to, to say no. Well, Ibrahim, let's, let's talk about China and this relationship with Africa. It's the largest uh, bilateral trading partner in 2021. China accounted for nearly $5 billion mm -hmm. in foreign direct investment in African countries. China is also its biggest bilateral lender. Uh, most of these infrastructure projects on the continent are financed by uh, China. So I want to get your assessment of what we've seen over the last 10 years and also uh, your thoughts on this criticism about it being a debt trap. Look, I think that um, in agreeing with Aina, um, there is a movement to say no. And the United Nations Secretary General has said that Africa, for example, pays four times more for lending from the West. And so when you look at China, you have long-term loans and you have an average 2% interest rates on those loans. So, I mean, that really is a, a gift um, to Africa. If one considers the way in which China has rescheduled, for example, debts with countries that are in cash flow situations, the terms are very, very um, generous um, to um, Africa. And so it's no wonder that at the recent BRICS conference just a few weeks ago in Johannesburg, Africa was very well represented. There were so many applications to join BRICS because people understand that there are alternatives to the hegemonic positions um, in the West. And so the debt trap has not only been rubbished in Africa, the debt trap has also been rubbished by, for example, Chatham House, John Hopkins. And so I really think that um, there are many rival institutions emerging to the Belt and Road Initiative, but none of them are at the scale and at the rate at which China is doing it. I mean, um, nothing compares from Biden's B2W or B3W, nothing compares even from Japan's um, Asia-Africa Initiative. And so, in a sense, I think it's becoming the only show in town. Well, let me ask you about the fundamental difference in approach as well. I, I, I talked to a woman from Kampala a few years back who, who worked for an NGO, a uh, Western NGO, and she said she'd be in these meetings. All these guys were Yale graduates. They talk about, all oh, this worked in Mozambique. It's going to work perfectly here in Uganda. And she'd be sitting there saying, this is never going to work here, but they never asked her for any input. Um, and she just said, eventually, the money was good, but she had to walk away from it. I talked to a friend in Nairobi who said, look, the West used to come in here and they'd say, here's money for this, here's some tractors or this and that. But she said it's different when China comes in and actually builds a rail line and you live in the countryside and now you can get your product to market in Nairobi in no time at all. That It's more of a partnership approach versus, oh, we're going to lend you a hand. Um, is that how you see it as well? Look, I think, Mike, you said it in your introduction that this is about connectivity by road, rail and sea and things need to get to markets. And I think what has been very good is that China has not monopolized all the supply chains back to China. What it has been able to do is to create a multiplicity of supply chains across the world, and so the transport time has been significantly less. So we don't need to send something to China and then send it back to Africa. I think we have the kind of connectivity that has been able to not only increase the speed at which things arrive at market, but also the cost has decreased for things to come to market. Jorge Einer mentioned your name earlier. Of course, 21 countries in Latin America have joined uh, BRI. I, I want to get you to weigh in, and then maybe we'll dig a little bit deeper as, with regards to Chile. But your thoughts? Sure. 
Now, what is interesting here is that BRI shows China's different approach to development. Uh, what China is saying is uh, infrastructure and uh, connectivity, as has been said, are critical to be able to promote development. This is different from the traditional Western approach, which relies basically on macroeconomic equilibria. That approach says, as long as you get inflation under control, you create the right uh, business climate, things will happen and development will come into its own. Well, it doesn't always happen that way. What China is saying is, you build railroads, you build highways, you build ports. And that is very important to foster development. So that's number one. Number two, what is important to underscore is that Latin America was not originally part of BRI. When it was announced, as you may recall, it was largely to recreate Eurasia, to connect the fastest growing area in the world, which is East Asia, with the biggest market, which is Europe. It was only a bit later that uh, Latin America came into the picture. And that is because Latin America itself, and I was involved in that, was interested in that to happen. So from recreating Eurasia, BRI evolved into basically a development program for uh, the global south. And the third point that I would like to make is that for Latin America, this was extremely important. Why? Because Latin America has huge infrastructure needs. There's a huge infrastructure deficit. Latin America has underinvested for many years in infrastructure. Therefore, the possibility of having Chinese companies coming in, building ports like the Chiang port in, in Peru, a $3.5 billion project that will change the connectivity between South America and Asia is extremely important. And there are many other projects across Latin America. Well, Jorge, uh, China is emerging as the region's second largest uh, trading partner for 10 consecutive years now. Ch Chilean exports to China reaching about $38 billion last year, according to the country's customs data. Uh, that accounts for about 40 percent of the country's total uh, exports. So talk to us about the relationship between China and Chile and how it's evolved. Of course. Well, here it is important to keep in mind that Chile was the first individual country to sign a free trade agreement with China as far back as 2005. ASEAN had signed one before, but ASEAN is a collective entity. So Chile was the first country, not just in Latin America, but in the world, to sign an FTA with China. That's number one. A lot of people were very skeptical in Chile at the time. And they said, well, this will create a huge problem. We'll run a huge trade deficit with China. We'll be flooded with Chinese products, and we will not be able to uh, export to the same degree. Well, that is not the case. To give you a figure, in 2005, the trade between Chile and China was $8 billion. Last year, it reached $65 billion. So an increase of eight times in 18 years. And Chile also is running a trade surplus with China. Again, to give you only one example, just in cherries, Chile exports over $2 billion to China. This is one fruit to one market. So the experience of uh, Chile's trading relationship with China has been very positive. And the other element that I would add is that in the course of the past few years, uh, Chinese investment, which had been lagging in the case of Chile, has also picked up. In 2019, uh, China was the number one source of uh, FDI in Chile, and again in 2021. So things are really looking up in the relationship between Chile and China. It's very interesting, uh, Anthony, you know, he, uh, Jorge was talking about uh, the neighbor to the north, Peru, building this mega port, and it's, uh, it's basically projected as South America's gateway to Asia. So we're seeing trade already. Uh, this is going to just fuel that even more. Give us a sense of where you think this is headed. Uh, you know, I think moving forward, maybe the, the massive number of projects might not necessarily continue. There may be more of a strategic shift to three, four, five sort of broad topic areas, perhaps. And again, I, I, I could be wrong you know, when, when I say that. But what I think is striking is as you're listening to all these numbers and all these percentages that, you know, I think there, there's one element to that that needs to be considered as well. And that is for lack of a better, a, a lack of a better phrase, the Chinese are willing to get their hands dirty. And what I mean by that is they're not, only, they're, they're not simply writing a check saying, si, you know, bye-bye, see you later. We'll talk in two or three years. But you're seeing uh, you're seeing them on the ground as being participants in these projects. And so what that suggests then, to me at least, is um, this idea of a partnership that was brought up, you know, certainly it is magnified. But I think it also is an indicator that, look, we want to be here in the short term and we want to be here in the long term. And I think 
one of the reasons you see such criticism in the United States and the West is because this is a method or an approach that by and large the West hasn't tried. It's largely been sort of a checkbook diplomacy uh, uh, for lack of a better description. Um, so you put these things together and my, my thought is that one of the reasons that the criticisms is so sharp is set aside the fact how successful it's been but because it's a method that's being tried, being accepted, and the West is still not adopted to or adapted to it. Well, let me talk to you about Italy, though. Uh, it's the only one in the group of seven nations to, to sign on in 2019, and now it's kind of trying to wiggle its way out of it, even though uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi has praised the results of the China-Italy cooperation through BRI. He says bilateral trade has jumped uh, from $50 billion to $80 billion. Um, exports growing, of course, from Italy to China. Why are they backing out, would you say? Well, I, I have to wonder if domestic politics plays a large role in it. And, and I forget the actual number, but I think it's 47 uh, 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 Italian government since the end of World War II. So we know there's a lot of instability sort of built into the Italian political system and therefore into the economic system as well. What we don't know as well is, you know, what kind of pressure are the other G members putting on Italy to either back away, to not get involved, to talk about trade positively, but not talk about BRI specifically. I have to think there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes that at least not yet have been reported that will give a little clearer picture as to why uh, the Italians are, are hedging their bets on BRI right now. Yeah, and I want to get your thoughts on that too about Italy's move because I remember I was in Hangzhou for the G20 and, and at that time Canada had signed on for the AIIB and, and the United States wasn't happy about that either. Well, yeah, I mean, we can't uh, forget that there's a geopolitical contest that is uh, going on here and that at the base of it, a lot of uh, the State Department has been gaslighting the world in terms of uh, China's involvement, uh, you know, going back to this whole debt trap diplomacy. Uh, if you actually look at the numbers in Africa, you know, China is about uh, one third of the total debt factor that's being held by uh, mostly private uh, entities in the West. So so if China's at 15 to 20 percent, these are anywhere 45 to 60 percent. Uh, they don't talk about that. They just keep repeating it. Also, you know, China has learned a lot over this uh, period. Um, they have started, stopped doing this kind of government to government loans. That didn't work out politically because the, any new party elected would automatically say that the loans by the previous party were uh, detrimental to the country. And that added to this kind of perception. And then uh, finally, uh, and that re has uh, resulted in a project by project approach, which means that it's either a project is either feasible or it's not, and it can be uh, promoted as such. Uh, you have entities like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, which is now taking a, a, a very institutional uh, look at these and making sure that the numbers look right so everyone knows exactly what they're getting into. And, you know, and finally, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there's this the major factor uh, for so many countries is uh, the ability to be independent. The Belt and Road Initiative does not come into a country and say, we're going to tell you how you're going to run your, your government. Uh, we're going to tell you that you have to align with us. It is simply agnostic. China comes in and says, you need a port. If you have that port, you can develop. We have interests uh, in both your markets and your resources, but this does not come with either ideological strings uh, or some sort of hold over your government. And that has uh, been, I think, one of the strongest parts. In terms of Italy itself, uh, yeah, it's pure politics. Uh, the, the question is, will this ambassador, I mean, is this current prime minister last longer uh, than the attempt to withdraw from uh, uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative? Yeah, well, I'll definitely keep our eyes on that for sure. Uh, Ibrahim, when we look at Africa, of course, it's been a lot of the traditional projects you would imagine, railways, ports, uh, roads, that sort of thing. Thing. But uh, China's shifting now more towards sustainability. That's led to an emphasis on, uh, you know, renewable energy, digital infrastructure, something known as the Health Silk Road, which is an emphasis on medical facilities uh, and treatment. South Africa has been dealing with rolling blackouts. Uh, can you talk about the need for more power and renewable energy? 
Look, I think that certainly South Africa is in a double bind. Its old infrastructure is creaking and not producing what should be done, and those were the carbon em emitting ones. And at the same time, the world is shifting to a renewable um, paradigm for energy. And I think it's in that kind of bind that South Africa is that China comes in and surprises the world because the propaganda is that China is a guzzler of carbons and an emitter of note. And suddenly it starts supporting um, renewable energy, um, helps countries like South Africa um, really make the transition from a carbon heavy to a renewable heavy. And most importantly, in the context of Africa as a whole, what it does is it says, we can help you not even go to the depth of carbon usage, we can immediately bring you into the renewable space with enough baseload that you may require for Africa's industrial revolution that um, is, is being born. And so I think um, that has really stunned the world. And then China also starts to say, let's work with the UN. Let's make sure that we align our our, our objectives for renewable energy, for sustainability, with what the UN has. And then China does another surprising thing. It invites, for example, the World Bank and the IMF to cooperate with the Asian Development Banks and so forth and to say, listen, stronger, we can be, um, we can be stronger together, to use the South African rugby um, slogan. And so really that becomes absolutely critical as a way in which I think Africa's double bind is being managed um, very well with the kind of investment that we're getting from China. And Jorge, uh, when you talk about digital infrastructure, uh, Latin America, that's a definitely a need there as well. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, it's not just uh, physical infrastructure that is badly needed, also digital. Uh, Chile is one of the countries that with the highest digital penetration in in, in, in Latin America, and we are fully aware of that potential. Uh, Huawei has a very strong uh, presence in Chile. They have provided the uh, cables to connect uh, the last uh, quarter of Chile's length from uh, Puerto Montt all the way to Puerto Williams, about a thousand kilometers long, uh, which until a few years ago had to be routed, uh, you know, internet connectivity had to be routed via uh, Argentina. It was intermittent and so on. And now, we have a uh, full connectivity uh, using you know uh, cables from um, you know chinese technology so uh, again uh, digital is uh, very much the way forward we live in the digital age and um, chinese companies of course have uh, quite an advantage in in that area and we're looking forward to continue to work with them Einer, uh, of course, the world's going through a lot of economic challenges. China is uh, no exception to that. Some analysts are saying China's, you know, strategy of doing a lot of business with developing countries can be rather risky. Uh, is, is there going to be any time where China may take a look at this and say, maybe we need to put a pause on things, or do you think it's full steam ahead? Well, uh, for China, the die has been cast. Uh, the real question, the only question now is is really Europe, uh, where it stands. Uh, as was said by my uh, previous colleague, uh, everything was aimed at Europe initially, uh, establishing this kind of backdoor um, to a huge market. But as time has gone by, uh, South America joining, etc., all of a sudden there's this realization that the future market uh, along with the future resources, is going to be coming from the Global South and the Central Asia. In fact, if you put those countries together, about 160 countries, guess what? They control the, uh, the GDP, the manufacturing, and the resources, uh, and the population, the markets. Uh, and this is a realization that you see happening with BRICS. Uh, both G7, 8, and uh, 20 they did not, uh, was not able to address things. BRICS are stepping into, in essence, a vacuum. Uh, but at some point, there's going to be a realization that uh, if they band together, especially those countries with strategic resources, and do an OPEC-like agreement where they can, instead of asking for money for um, you know, climate change and things like that, they can simply price it into their 
uh, commodities that they sell, uh, not only uh, for climate change, but also for their own development uh, so that they can pay uh, what is necessary. I mean, this, this whole thing about Belt and Road Initiative in, 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 in the West has been, why should these poor countries rise? You know, it's very useful for us to strip out their uh, their uh, resources very cheaply. So there's a real potential that things are going to change dramatically. Obviously, there will be a lot of counterpunching coming from areas like the United States who do, would not want to see this. This would be an impingement on their wealth uh, over the long period of time. It would rise, create inflationary pressures that had never seen before. So uh, we are at a, 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 a watershed point and we'll have to see what happens. But in terms of China, China is all in. It needs to have markets that uh, want to trade with it, but it needs to have those markets healthy and developed. And that is something that is very different from the approach, uh, the post-colonial approach, or not post, uh, the colonial approach that was uh, still in existence of, of, uh, just a few years ago. Well, Ibrahim, I'm going to give you the final thought on all of this, because we kind of let off this discussion talking about the Chinese estimates at the top of the program that the BRI has lifted uh, nearly 40 million people out of poverty. It's, it's really easy to look at these as projects, but it's also about people, and in this case, poverty as well, and, and uplifting, as Einer said. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and the, basically the lasting legacy of a project like this? Look, I think that um, 40 million people being lifted out of poverty through the BRI and a third of the countries are in Africa, it can only be good news for the development of a middle class um, in Africa. I think that coupled with a developmental emphasis um, in addition to the logistics and the infrastructure means um, impact on health, impact on education and digital connectivity. And I think that that helps Africa not only be prepared on the energy front for its industrial revolution, but certainly for the digital yeah. revolution that I think Africa has already introduced. And so all in yeah. all, for yeah. Africa, it is great to be part of two thirds of a global population that is in the BRI and share in 40% yeah. of global GDP. Right. So that's a great um, impact for Africa. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.